Welcome back to Rock the JVM, folks. This is Daniel, and in this video, I'm going to give you a gentle introduction to generics in Scala for beginners. Now, I made this video because during my Scala courses, I noticed that those of you coming from Python and JavaScript and other dynamically typed languages, the notions around Scala's type system and especially generics are particularly hard. So I made this video to smoothen the learning curve for you. So if you are getting started with Scala and you come from languages with dynamic typing such as Python and JavaScript, this video is for you. And as always, I'll recommend that you write code with me and whenever you need to refresh your memory about these concepts just refer back to the video or to the written form at the blog with the link in the description. You might also want to check out some of the courses here at Rock the JVM. All right, so here is me in IntelliJ IDEA with a very simple object that I call generics and with a main method in case we need to test something so that we can have this application as standalone. So right now we have a simple application that doesn't really do anything and I'm going to start writing some code to demonstrate the kind of concepts that I wanted to show you. Now in this project, I'm writing Scala 3, but all the code that I'm going to write here will also be applicable in Scala 2. So don't worry about it. You can use any Scala version that you like. And in this video, I'm going to show you a bunch of concepts about generics. So what generics are and how to use them. So how to use generics and more importantly, why they exist. Because those of you coming from Python or JavaScript and other dynamically typed languages may find generics to be a little weird. Now I discuss all these concepts with great detail and also exercises in the Scala 3 Essentials course if you're interested in checking that out. But I'm going to give you a brief overview of all these concepts so that generics are at least a little clearer for you. So you probably know already as you're studying Scala that Scala has a static type system, meaning that the types of every single expression is known to the compiler before the code even runs. So if I define a value, let's say a list, I'm going to have list one, two, three. This is a list of integers and the Scala compiler already knows that. Now, if you come from Python, if you define a list as the list one, two, three, this is simply a list that Python does not know that it is a list until you actually run the program. And the elements of the list themselves might be of different types. So this is Python and this is the main difference between these type systems. So Python just declares this variable and until you evaluate this list, Python has no idea the type that the list has or the types of the elements within. And JavaScript is no different. If you define var or let or const, there are a bunch of syntaxes there. And if you define a list as the list one, two, three, the same story occurs in JavaScript as well. So the list itself is not known to JavaScript until the runtime actually evaluates this value and it evaluates the elements within. And the elements within can be of different types. By contrast, the expression list123 is already known to the compiler to be a list of integers. So exactly that. And if you hover over this value, you notice that a list has the type list of int automatically attached by the type infer of the Scala compiler. And the type infer and the static type system in Scala will allow us to make assumptions about the data that we're working with. So for example, if I define a number as 42, because what other number can you define? This number is known to be an int. So notice that the type has already been attached by the type infer. Of course, you can define it yourself, but why not make the type infer do some work for you? And because this number is an int, there are several operations that you can already perform on an int, and there are several operations that you cannot perform on an int because those are not supported on this type. So for example, if I define a multiplication as a number times 10, this is possible because we know for a fact that the number is int and therefore the multiplication with 10 is legal. But if I define something of another type, let's say a Boolean as false, and I try another multiplication, so another multiplication as a Boolean 
times 10, this kind of operation is not allowed on Boolean. So if I try recompiling this code, notice that a Boolean times 10 is not a legal expression because the times 10 is not available on the Boolean type. Whereas in the other languages, Python and JavaScript and other dynamically typed languages, you'd have to wait until the runtime to figure out if the multiplication or the expression is legal. So there's nobody stopping you from defining a multiplication as a list divided by 300 or something like that. And the code will simply not show you any kind of error until you actually start running it and you'll notice that the operation is illegal. So this would not work. And types, that is static typing, the association between expressions and types at the compiler level, this mechanism is very useful because we can eliminate some of the cognitive load that we as programmers have while writing code, because in dynamic languages, such as Python or JavaScript, we always still hold the types in our head to make sure that our code will work correctly. Whereas with a static typing like Scala's, we can delegate this task of deciding the correctness of the expressions to the compiler before we actually build our application and ship it and see it crashing. So this is the reasoning and the pitch of a static type system. Now let's go back to generics. So when I define a list with a particular set of numbers or elements inside, the compiler infers that to be a list of the appropriate type. In this case, a list of integers. And this type integer is very, very important. I'm actually going to add it here explicitly, although the type infer will add it as well. The type that I specify here will allow me to make assumptions about the elements contained in this list. So for instance, if I want to say second element, that will be a list dot apply at the index one because lists are zero indexed. I know for a fact that this is an integer, whereas with Python or JavaScript, I would have to inspect its type or attempt some sort of operation to see if that's supported. So the generic type is useful here so that we can make assumptions about the elements of this list and about the list's API. So for example, if I want to add a new element to this list, I can say a an appended list or a prepended list. I can say a list and I'm going to use this very fancy operator colon plus and I'm going to add the element four. I can add this element and I'm going to return the list one, two, three, four. So the list one, two, three, four as a list of integers. So as a list of int, the list of the same type that I had originally. So one reason why generics exist is that we can make assumptions about the types that the data structure works with. So that's the reason number one, which is a reason for the users of data structures which are generics. Now, for us as programmers of such data types, or if we want to design our own libraries, we can reuse some logic on many types, on potentially unrelated types. And I'm going to give you an example. Let's say you want to define your own list data structure in a purely functional way. I'm going to define that as a trait. You probably know what traits are. I'm going to call this my list. And I'm going to define the list under its main fundamental API, which is head. I'm going to start with an integer and the tail, which is the rest of the list, except the head. And uh, this will be of type my list. So this will be the general interface of the list data structure. The head returns the first element and the tail returns everything but the first element, which is again of type my list. And I'm actually going to implement this my list of integer by defining an object. I'm going to call this empty and this extends my list. You probably know what objects are. They are singleton objects. So this instance empty is the only instance of this type which is the empty list. So I'm going to override the head and I'm going to throw new no such element exception because there is no element return from the head. And I'm actually going to copy that and I'm going to implement the tail method in the same way because this empty list has no data. Whereas if I define a case class, a case class is just a data structure with a bunch of fields that has 
uh, some serialization properties and it's very easy to work with, you can define it as a regular class if you wish. There's no big difference for this demonstration. I'm going to call this non-empty. And I'm going to pass it two arguments, a head, which is an int, and a tail, which is a my list. And this will be extends my list. And uh, I'm going to override the head to be h, the first argument, and I'm going to override tail to be the second argument. So this is a very, very simple instance of a my list uh, data structure. And if you want to see an example, let's say some numbers as say my list and I'm going to define a new non-empty with the element one and the rest of this list is going to be again a non-empty with the element two and non-empty with element three and let's say I want to finish here so I'm going to define that as an empty. So this is an example of a my list data type whose head is one and the rest is another list whose head is two and the rest is another list whose head is three and so on and so forth until we stop at empty. Now, assuming that you want to extend or expand the coverage of this my list to other types, maybe you want to define a list of strings as well. The question is, how would you do that? And one option would be to copy it. So I would copy my list and I'm going to paste it here and I'm going to call this trait my list, let's say string and I'm going to return head as a string. So I have to change my API and uh, therefore I need to copy this trait. This needs to be another trait. I'm gonna call this object empty string, which extends my list string. So I'm gonna copy most of this and I'm gonna create a case class non empty string whose head is a string. The tail is my list string, extends my list string. So in this way, by copying the logic of my list, I'm supporting this data type for the string type as well. So if I want to define some strings, this will be a my list string, and this will be a non empty string with let's say the string I and the non empty string with the string love, and then a non empty string with the string Scala, and then let's say uh, empty string here. So much the same thing as we did with integers, now we can do with strings after copying the entire implementation just supporting string. Now, you might be thinking a little ahead and you want to support my list for pretty much any type at all, which would probably copy this to uh, have the head and tail return my list where the type that you want to support is any, which is the mother or father of all types, depending on how you want to look at it. And I'm going to copy this entire thing. So if you want to expand to all types, you would have to say something along these lines. I'm going to call this my string, my list any actually. And instead of head uh, to be a string, I'm going to say head is any which can be an int, a string, a boolean, a person, or anything else. And I'm going to replace empty string with empty any, my list string, my list any, non empty string with non list any. I'm going to replace string with any everywhere. So this would be an intuitive approach, but if you try to do something like this, then you've lost the very reason why types exist because my list any, if you try to obtain some sort of element from this list, or if you want to add new elements or whatever else you want to do with this list, this gives you no guarantees about the elements of this list. So this my list any can contain ints, strings, booleans, and so on in the same list. So notice that the previous solution where we had my list just of ints or my list just of strings, this thing can allow elements of all types into one list, which is probably not what you want because it gives you no guarantees that the elements that you work with belong to the same type. We say that you've lost type safety. Meaning that the reason that a type system actually exists to make assumptions about the data, you've lost the capability to make any assumptions here in this implementation. To give you an example, in the example with the my list of integers, for instance, 
uh, we can sum up all the numbers because we know for a fact that all the elements in this list are numbers. And here in the my list string, we can make an assumption that all the elements in this list are strings, so we can concatenate them all and we can make a sentence. I love Scala, for instance. But in the case of a my list any, we cannot make any assumption about any element in the list. And so we cannot really run any operations until we can test their types and so on and so forth, which basically lost all the benefits of a static type system, which is why generics were introduced to be able to reuse the logic on any type and to be also able to make assumptions about the elements of this list. And the way that we say that a list is supposed to be generic is to say, I'm going to define this trait, I'm going to call this good list or G list or generic list if you want to name it like that. And in between square brackets, I'm going to pass what is called a type argument. And this type argument is usually named with single letters like A, B, T, S, and that sort of thing. And uh, I'm going to define a trait good list of the type argument A, which means that whenever you define a good list with a particular type argument, that type will apply to the entire body of this good list. So for example, if I define my head API to return an element of type A, so notice that once I've defined the type A, it's known inside the body of good list and define, let's define def tail which is a good list of A. Now I can make an assumption that once I've defined a good list of a particular type, the head of that list will be an element of that type. So if I define a list of integers, let's say good numbers, which is a good list of int, for instance, and I can leave that blank for now, I can say for sure that first number which is good numbers dot head is automatically an integer. And that's because I've already typed the good list with the type int and therefore the head will return that particular type, which is int in this case. And so I can make an assumption about all the elements in this list. And for instance, I can sum them up to return one value. And so I can very well implement one trait to be available for all types and still have type safety. So I'm going to implement this good list with a case class. I'm going to call this empty. I'm going to call this good empty with a type argument A and no arguments. And the reason I have done a case class instead of an object is because this object needs to be a singleton. And if I added a type argument, then this object would not be unique. And this would contradict the very definition of an object. And so I would have to create a case class. Also, the compiler doesn't allow you to do that. And I'm going to extend good list. And I'm going to implement both head and tail with the same implementations because the head will be an A and tail will be a good list of A. So I will have to add the type argument here as well. And I'm going to create a case class for good non-empty, which takes a type argument A, a head which is an A, and a tail which is a good list of A. So notice that now that we have a type argument, we'll need to provide the type consistency everywhere. And this extends good list of A. And now I'm going to override head and tail with the exact same implementation as before. The head will be an A and tail will be a good list of A. So not good list of any, but good list of A. And now I can define my good numbers. For instance, I can define good non-empty with one, good non-empty with two, good non-empty with three, and let's say good empty with these parentheses here so that I can construct a case class instance. So this is a legal good list of integers because all the elements conform to the same type. And good numbers dot head is known to be an integer. So if I try recompiling this code, I'm using command shift nine here, but you can also use build and then rebuild project. And uh, I'm using here a tail, which is not my list, but my list string. I forgot to mention that during my copying. So notice that copying is not good. All right. And uh, this 
has the same kind of mistake because I copied the list string, of course. All right, so notice that the good list now conforms to the same type and good numbers dot head is known to be an integer. Conversely, if I try mismatching the type here, so for instance, if I replace the three with a string Scala, then if I try recompiling this code, then the compiler will find my error here, meaning that the string does not conform to the rest of the types, which is good. We want the compiler to find these type mismatches for us before we run the application. So this is how you can define a generic trait or a class. You can also define generic methods and you can add multiple type arguments. So you can add multiple type arguments. These A's over here, they're called type arguments because they are then replaced with concrete types such as int. And you can add multiple type arguments in the type signature. So for example, if you define a trade for dictionary or map, you can define my map with two type arguments k and v. And I've used the k and v to denote the fact that the first is a key and the v is the value. And the main API for my map might be to put an element, a key of type k, and a value of type v, and this might return a new my map of k and v. So notice that once you've defined k and v here in the square brackets, you can use the k and v inside the body of my map. And if you want to say get an element at a particular key, you'll return a particular value. And this might throw if the particular key that you're trying to search is not in the map for instance. So this is just an example of where you would add multiple type arguments. And you can also define generic methods, that is methods with type arguments. So for instance, I might extend the API for this good list to have an external method, let's say last element, which takes a type argument A, and now that you've defined the type argument A, you can use it in the rest of the method signature and in the method implementation. So I can say list as a good list of A, for instance, and this might return an A, which is the last element of the list. And an implementation might look something like this. If the list is equal to good empty for that particular type, then I'm going to throw new no such element exception because an empty list will not have a last element because it doesn't have any elements at all. Otherwise, if the list tail is equal to good empty, then I'm going to return list.head because if the list.tail is equal to good empty, then the list contains only one element, so I need to return the first or the only element in that list. Otherwise, I might want to call this method recursively. So last element with list.tail. And this implementation is possible because I know for a fact that I can construct a good empty for that particular type. I'm actually going to make this explicit so that you know the types here. So the list is equal to good empty of that same type. List.tail is a list of the same type as the original. And the last element with list.tail is also a valid expression because list.tail belongs to the same type. So notice how type safety works in our favor with generics. So that was a gentle introduction to Scala generics for folks coming from Python, JavaScript, or other dynamically typed languages. I hope you liked this video. You can find this sort of examples and also exercises and more in-depth explanations in the Rock the JVM courses. You can check them out in the description below. And if you like the Rock the JVM channel, go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Check me out on Twitter and LinkedIn. I post fresh updates on upcoming material. And check out rockthejvm.com for lots of videos and blog posts like this. Until next time, I'm Daniel signing off.